Hey folks, welcome back. This is Lucid, and we have a new series coming up. Uh, it's going to be another Blitz. We're kind of doing a lot of Blitzes. It's going to be open table uh, discussion. So I know that's some of y'all's... Some of you like it, and then some don't. Um, anyway, uh, it's going to be a Hellenica Blitz, which I don't think we've done. No, we did. We did, uh, I did the Triliax one. Um, anyway, we're going to be doing another one. And this time... I'm going to be playing uh, Isfinapul, and uh, this is a pretty cool nation. I had a request um, from one of my Patreon uh, supporters to do a national overview uh, for this nation, and I kind of was delaying doing it because uh, the doing a national overview for a Hellenic nation takes a ton longer than doing one for a normal nation. And that's because there's all these weird mechanics you have to understand. And honestly, the game hasn't started. I've spent at least 10 hours trying to figure out this nation. You know, figuring out expansion testing, reading through, like reading all the spells, reading all the items, reading all the units, thinking about how they all fit together. So it takes a long time. Um, anyway, and so by the time I've done that, uh, and I have a, a decent national overview, like one that I think I could play a game with, uh, I, I kind of actually just want to try the nation in a game. So uh, anyway, that was why I kind of set up this Blitz, because I knew I wanted to do this national overview, um, and then I realized by the time I did it, I might as well play them. So let's talk about the nation. Uh, this is a nation that has absolute unparalleled research supremacy. Um, it can potentially be the fastest researching nation in the game. Um, I mean, it can get to... Let me put that in context. It can get to level 7 research by, like, turn 7 or 8. I'm not sorry. I'm sorry. By turn 17 or 18. Uh, which is crazy fast. Like, when you get to uh, 7 in, in research in something that can totally change the dynamic of a battle like it's it's not like an incremental improvement it can be like a complete restructuring of how the battle is going to go um, and that's normally what mid game is about the mid game is normally about getting a, you know a level seven or two um in some path and then you know running off and fighting with it well we potentially with this nation can get into the mid game as early as turn like 17 or 18 which is nuts it's absolutely crazy absolutely crazy so and it doesn't slow down it speeds up from there <clears throat> um okay so let's take a look the other thing i'll just say in the opening just as in terms of like super general overview is there's two basic ways to play this nation. One is with sloth scales, and the other is with productivity scales. Um, and it will change a good bit about how the nation plays. Um, you will research, in general, much, much faster with sloth scales. And that's because of the philosopher, which we'll talk about. Um, however, the late game for productivity scales is probably better. And that's because you can get free sacred statues uh, they take a ton of resources to produce, um, and therefore having productivity scales will make a big difference, especially compared to taking Sloth 3. Okay, so um, let us talk about the nation. Um, and I want to start with the commanders. So we have an engineer who is a mason. Um, and he also has castle and siege defense bonus. And for 40 gold, it's pretty cheap. Um, you can get these anywhere. And they can research too. Now, uh, one of the things we'll struggle with as this nation is sieging very efficiently. And the reason is we don't have very cheap troops. All our troops are kind of expensive, except for maybe the militia. But even them, like these are our cheap, cheapest troops and they're 14 gold. And they're 10 strength, right? So not good siege troops. These guys are actually going to be important for sieges. They're also going to be pretty good at castle defense bonus. If we think we're going to have to sit in our castle, you can spam these guys out. And you can potentially get three a turn in a citadel. And that is a lot of siege defense. Now, what is important to note 
is that the siege defense, even though it says siege defense um, 25, this still gets cut in half, which I think is actually a little odd to how it works, but anyway, it does. Because it doesn't actually add 25 siege defense. Um, oh, it, no, it does. Yeah. Okay, each point is effective as having one human defender. Okay, but that that part is still true. Um, because one human defender would only contribute half of a siege defense. Right? Am I right? Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's important. They're also masons so they can upgrade your stuff into citadels. Um, we have um, a, this guy who's a commander. He's inspirational minus one. Basically a shitty commander. Uh, we have this guy, the philosopher. Now these are very special. They're old, which kind of sucks. So they'll get afflicted and die, but they're only 50 gold. Um, and they are going to get bonus research. So they have 10 research. They are going to get bonus research for every sloth scale you have of two. So in sloth three, they're gonna research for 16, which is nuts. Um, additionally, they are recruit anywhere and foreign recruit. So you can get these in a province without a lab because they don't have a magic path associated with them. And you might be thinking, oh shit, that's kind of crazy. 16 research per turn from a foreign recruit mage without a lab? Lucid, that sounds like madness. Um, and I would say you don't even know the best part yet. And the best part is <clears throat> if the province you recruit them in has sloth scales, then when they spawn, even though it's not shown here, they will get a path in astral. That's right. So not only are they good researchers, but they're extremely efficient. Kind of, I mean, they're just they're good Astro One mages, and Astro One mages, you can do innumerable things with. So this is completely balanced. Completely balanced. Um, next up, we have the skeptic, who's just a stealthy heretic, because of course. Which is, by the way, a very good thing. One of the things, we're, we're going to talk about how this nation plays once we're kind of done with the units, but, um, and I, I might pull up a different test game where I just tested expansion. Um, but anyway, so these guys are obviously going to be pretty helpful in controlling your dominion. And c controlling your dominion with this nation is going to be challenging. And I guess we'll talk about some of that now instead of later. Um, part of the reason why it's challenging is your temples are really expensive and your forts are really expensive. So you're not... And for a bunch of reasons, like the fact that we have foreign recruit mages, we're not going to have, most likely, a lot of forts and temples, which means our dominion pressure is going to be often pretty low, and there are major exceptions to that, but they cer it certainly has the potential to be very low. So this can be a very important ingredient of controlling your dominion by just keeping enemy dominion out. Next up, we have the High Bookkeeper, who is our commander, 60 leadership, um, he can do formations for his troops. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but I know he can. Um, he has inspirational plus one, which is nice. He has a patrol bonus, which is kind of nice. Um, and he is fire resistant five. Now this is significant because a lot of our dudes have fire weakness. And so having dudes that have fire resistance um, is pretty valuable because otherwise we kind we of get wrecked by a lot of fire stuff. Um, this guy is significant. There are a few items this guy can wear. One is the, there's a girdle we'll, we'll talk about, but he can basically also thug. And he has the Sword of the Conclave, which gets, I believe it gets different effects. Like this one's pure magic, eight armor negating damage added to attack. Pretty nice. Um, and then decent armor protection. A little expensive. Um, the, the girdle he can get, which is going to use earth gems, I believe. Or it could be pearls. I can't remember. We'll find out in a minute. Um, it is going to bless him, so that is, and it's going to give him stone skin. So he will be have a pretty damn solid stat line uh, with just that, and depending on what you take on your bless. Okay, um, next up we have the sage. Now the sage is an adept researcher eight. Um, this actually is less research than the philosopher. Uh, and significantly more gold if you go sloth. Now, if you go productivity, which I think is viable, but I, from all the looking at it I've done, it doesn't seem as good. 
it seems a lot slower, a lot slower. Um, but it has a better late game potentially, especially if you have a good blast, but I think you're a little more vulnerable in the early mid game and stuff. Maybe significantly more vulnerable. Anyway, um, this dude, um, yeah, I mean, you get super excited when you find a sage, like a library is a, is a site when you're playing the game, which is, uh, libraries give these guys. And yeah, I mean, super solid research if you go productivity. Um, but they're not foreign recruits, so you're going to need to have a fort to get a sage. Oh, wait, no. These are foreign recruit. You've got to be kidding me. One second. Oh, yeah. Okay, they are. But you're going to have to drop a lab. Okay, so it's not it's not as bad as I thought. Um, God, I didn't actually know that. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so they're foreign recruit, but you have to drop a lab. Now, labs for you are cheap. They're 25 gold. Um, the nice thing about dropping a lab is you can potentially, you don't have to waste the turn moving them. You can just have the sages camp out there. And um, if you have 10 astro mages sitting in a province... Um, that's going to be very resistant to, like, thug raiders and stuff coming in, especially once you have some thaumaturgy researched. So, you know, it's a kind of good PD defense. Um, but, you know, if they send in something that they can't, that those sages can't kill, well, good luck, because uh, you're going to lose some of your research core. But, yeah, I mean, I, you can see how this is a lot slower going, because you have to drop 250 on a lab and then you're paying more and they're going to have more upkeep than a philosopher though so anyway but i mean this is a phenomenal researcher so i don't want to like say it's trash um next up we have the archivist now these are interesting for a few reasons one so they're astral two they get an earth or an astral path now the earth randoms um they can do like buffs on themselves, um, and they can also wear. There's a there's a bunch of scrolls and special items we're going to talk about for the nation that they can get, um, and basically they can wield these like scrolls and stuff like weapons and shields. It's kind of weird, but we'll, we'll show them to you. Um, and so these guys can potentially thug, which is very odd when you look at it. Like the earth ones especially are going to be your better thugs, which is weird. Um, they have invulnerability 10, so even the astral ones with good armor will be pretty tough. Um, they're susceptible to fire, which is a bit of a, a, you know, a sad fate, and they're a spy. They also have sloth power 1, which means, if you see, they actually have pretty good attack and defense stats for a mage. These are going to be good uh, once you get in um, sloth 3. They're going to be, you know, defense 15, attack 16. That's pretty damn awesome. Um, so anyway, it's kind of cool. They're not sacred, but they can wield. There's an exorcism scroll they can put on that will bless them. And you could also put a shroud on them if you wanted to make them sacred. Um, so yeah, but the fact that they're stealthy too is pretty nice. And they have pretty high stealth. Okay, so that is the Archivist. Um, next we have the Keeper of Secrets. Um, these guys are kind of cool. They are all Holy One, which, first of all, if you'll notice, we haven't had any priests so far, right? We've had a Heretic. We've had, basically, low Astral Mages. We've had this guy who gets, you know, like an Air... I mean, yeah, a, an Earth or Astral Random with a small chance of Air or more Earth and Astral. But then we've got this guy. He's our first priest. And he can come with any of the paths. One of any of the paths, right? So um, we also get a spell with this nation that is going to allow any holy one to jump into a communion. Now, it's a bit odd because you cannot be a communion master or slave, even if you have the spell, if you have no magic paths. And holy doesn't count. So this guy will be able to jump in communions, but any priests and stuff won't be able to be communion masters and whatever. Um, 
Now, what's important about these guys? Well, they have okay research because they're adept researchers. Um, you potentially could use these guys as your main research core, especially if you take high magic. Um, these guys are going to be better at researching per upkeep. These are 56 upkeep a year for, in Magic 3, they're going to be 16. Um, and then if you compare that to the Sages, they are going to be, uh, well, it's not a Sage. <clears throat> they're going to be 20 um, and then a little bit uh, more upkeep. So these guys are actually probably still actually a little better in terms of um, uh, upkeep per RP because they're a bit more upkeep but they're also a bit more RP um, but these guys are uh, the Keeper of Secrets are a bit better I would say generally more useful um, they have the built-in invulnerability which is nice and um, because they can enter communions with holy they're going to be able to cast basically you know if you have enough of them any spell in the game eventually right so you can think about getting maybe a mix of uh sages and these guys and then have a communion where the sages are the the slaves and these guys are the masters something like that um the problem though is if you want anything in particular you are gonna have to wait a while for it you know like on average, it's going to be eight turns of recruiting these guys to get the one thing you want. Um, yeah. I, I think they may be able to do... Let me see if they can do scroll fencing too. Oh, and they do not master the art of scroll fencing though. Okay. Next, we have the Great Archivist. Now... Um, I can't remember if these guys can do scroll fencing. I Let me check real quick. We'll take a look at our scrolls. Uh, can be used by archivists and great archivists. Yeah, so these guys can. I thought they could. Um, okay, so these guys can do, they're basically like your, they're, they're one of your scroll fencers, just like the archivist. They have much better paths. They're all going to have Earth 1, then at least Astral 3, and then they're going to have a 100% chance for Earth Astral, and then they're going to have a 20% chance for Earth Astral, and then they're going to have a 20% chance for Earth Air, which means if you get lucky on all these, you can have really high path mage here. And you're going to have a pretty good shot at getting Earth, too. So a lot of these are going to be Earth, too. I haven't run the odds, but it's uh, going to be a lot more than 50%. Uh, well, uh, it's probably, it's actually probably, I think, 60%. But I could be wrong. Uh, are going to be at least Earth, Earth 2. Uh, but anyway, so they're stealthy, they have invulnerability, um, they're spies, and um, they have sloth power. And the sloth power, just like the archivist, can give them pretty good stats. If they get a stat debuff, though, from being old, um, but yeah, these guys, you know, if you want to, there's a bunch of Earth Astral sp Bellas this nation has and it's one of the things these guys can do they also start with the temporary pearl so they can basically you know jump into a communion do power of the spheres for free if you're thugging with them they're also high astral you can if you want to just do power of the spheres at the start of combat and then if you have air or earth or anything it's going to get you up to earth too with this so basically they could always these guys can always do power of the spheres summon earth power in that order. There's nothing, like, every single random won't be able to do that. Um, and then, yeah. So in in Sloth, or, or, yeah, in Sloth scales, they're going to have okay attack and defense stats, but not great. Next up, we have the Lore Master. And these are cap, so let's talk about which ones are cap only. Um... Yeah, okay. 
So um, these guys are recruited anywhere. Everybody to the left is recruited anywhere. These last three, the Great Archivist, the Lore Master, and then the Keeper of Highest Mysteries are cap only. So uh, the Lore Master is just the, the standard Lore Master. You get 300 gold, and then they get three rolls at any of the paths. So you can get two in a path. You could even get three in a path, but it's very unlikely. Um, and these are going to be the main way you get magic diversity on this nation. Um, there's also a special item that these guys can build. And I guess we'll kind of cover the items a bit at a time. Um, there's special items you can get. They're these cloaks. And there's one for each path. And uh, you get plus one magic. And then you get minus fire resistance. And you get a temporary gem of that type. And you get invulnerability 10. And you get bless. And this is all for uh, seven gems of whatever type we're talking about. For blood, it's a different cost. Find the blood one. It's 25, which is a bit more. But, uh... oh wait, does this not get the gold? Oh, I didn't know it. This one doesn't give gold. Huh, this one's kind of inferior, actually. I didn't actually know that. It's more like a path-boosting item. But all the other ones are going to give you gold and then a temporary gem. Um, okay, so let's talk about the Lore Master. So that when the Lore Master puts it on, um, the amount of gold they get per turn is going to be uh, 35. Now, if you divide this by 12... Um, it's going to be 20 gold uh, twenty gold a month. So um, 35 is how much you get a month from the, the robe. So basically the difference is 15. So when you put the robe, like if you have a lore master and you put one of the, the robes on them, they're going to be generating 15 gold per turn net. And you now have an upkeep for a unit. Um, they're old though, so they tend to kind of die off, and they're pretty old. They're not like the other guys are like barely old. These guys are actually, you know, old, old. Um, and then, yeah, pretty good researchers. In my opinion, you want to use these guys to site search, which is kind of weird because you normally look at the lore master, you're like, three path mage for three hundred bucks. Why would you ever site search with that? Well, I think what you do is you make the cloak and you have them site search. If you can't, if you don't have the gems to make the cloak, you go out and site search till you get the gems, and you come back and you make the cloak, and then you go out and site search more. You're gonna have tons of research, but what you're not gonna have tons of is gems. So you need to go out and find those gems, and this is gonna be one of the best guys to do that for you. So it's kind of weird, actually. But once they're done, these are also going to be like your magic diversity, your economy, all these things. Um. And I think you have an item, too, which will let you... We'll have to find it. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, which will let you jump into communions um, and kind of have these guys add these paths to communions. If you don't, you... Let me check. So I think there's an item for it. Uh... don't see it off the top of my head. Okay, I, I don't see it actually. So it may be that if they're not an astral random or a blood random, which would obviously let them jump into communions, that if you want to get one of these other paths onto a communion, you may actually need these uh, these Keeper of Secrets. So you may actually have to have a lot of these getting produced in your forts, and then you'll need to have your, like these would be potentially your communion mages, like your, your masters, and then these would be your slaves, either the philosophers or the, the sages. Um, but potentially you can use lore masters for that also. Um, and then oftentimes a lore master with the cloak they're going to be at least two, and then if they have a, you know, if they were lucky and got two in one path, 
They could be three with the cloak. Um, but then a lot of times they can do like Phoenix power or Earth power or whatever and get up to four or three. So that's going to allow them to cast a fair number of spells in battle, but in reality you're going to want to have things you can put on your communion. Um, so anyway, these guys are super important. Um, they're cap only, and they generate gold per turn, basically, if you can get the, the cloak on them. Um, so you're going to be limited, though, in how many you can produce. You can't, like, the gold per turn scaling isn't infinite. And it's a kind of slow payback. Like, if you think about it, you're getting 15 gold per turn, but it's a 300 gold investment. So it's kind of, it's, it's not exactly a, a short payback time. Um, next up, we have the Keeper of Highest Mysteries. And this guy's a bit odd. He's Holy Three, and he has Dominion Immortality. So if he dies in Friendly Dominion, he just comes back. Um, he has Adept Researcher of 50. Uh, but he has no ability to research. Um, and the way this guy works is kind of weird. So if you empower him, the idea is he's kind of a keeper of, of ancient knowledge. But he doesn't share it with anybody. And so if you empower him, they would gain two more magic paths than they normally would. So if you empowered him in Earth, he would jump up to Earth 3, not Earth 1. Which is kind of interesting. This allows you to get into higher schools of magic than you otherwise would. Um, whereas normally it would take a... Like, even with a lore master, you're never going to get three. Like, you're never going to be an air three. But you could potentially empower this guy in air, and then you get an air three. Um, and then once you empower him, he's going to be able to research well. So you may also have times when you feel the need for divine blessing. If you want that, and you don't want to try to finagle it as part of a communion, which is, by the way, easy to do with these guys since they're communion masters... If you don't want to do that, you can drop the 5 hundo on this guy. In general, though, I think you're not going to make many of these. If you make them, it's going to be for a very specific kind of empowering, or you want to claim thrones or something like that. Um, or you don't want to do a normal communion to get uh, blessing off. So we've been through all the unit, uh, the, the mages, and we see some, like the most powerful obviously powerful mechanic in here is the philosophers uh, but then you can see there's a ton of versatility you basically are going to have access to every single magic path i mean let that sink in what other nations can say that and at whatever at an arbitrary level with communions so what other nation has access to every single magic path at any level and they're the fastest researching faction in the game by a margin. So you maybe some of this is kind of coming to light about how this nation could play. Uh, next up, we have militia. Uh, these guys you can get in waste in your cat and forts. You can get them in wastelands, and you can get them in uh, swamps, I think. And they're fourteen gold, fifteen resources, fourteen recruitment points. They have a javelin. Pretty good armor. I don't know. There's not too much to say about them. They're okay. Um, they do have Wasteland and Swamp Survival, which makes them somewhat mobile. Um, we have the Guardian of Knowledge. Now, these guys are, are interesting. They have Fire Resistance, which is important, because a lot of the items, like the scrolls and stuff, they're going to give us Fire Weakness. And these guys, our other unit, have Fire Weakness. Uh, and a lot of our mages have, you know, Fire Weakness. Right, so these guys have fire resistance. They have a patrol bonus, which is nice. Um, and then they're a bodyguard, which is nice. Um, and um, they also have the ability to summon allies, which is an active ability. It's the thing where you hit space bar and you say summon allies. Um, but they can only do it if they're a commander, and these guys are not commanders. And their commander equivalent, these guys, the high bookkeepers, they don't have the ability. So if you choose to divine name them, you can start auto-producing more of these guys that will basically summon more of themselves. Which is interesting. But we don't have any... There's no national spell for us, that I, at least that I have seen that allows us to do divine name any cheaper. So it's still a 25 gem 
you know, thing. And so, like, is it worth paying 25 gems to start getting one of these guys per turn? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, and the same goes for these guys. You can, if you divine name these, these are your other dudes, the fencers, uh, you can get more of them every turn as well. So anyway, a bit strange, uh, but potentially, you know, that could be a strong mechanic in the late game. Now, um, let's finish talking about these. So they have pretty good protection, 18, which is pretty solid. A good shield, which means they're going to be mostly immune to arrows. Um, pretty good defense. And they have the anti-magic sword. Or they have this sword, which is going to come in different varieties. This one, which is two armor negating damage, it's double damage versus magic beings. Kind of cool. Do I have a bunch of these recruited? I don't. We'll get a few. I want to show you. So here you can see we have a bunch. We have this guy who has a cold enchanted sword, which is going to do four cold AP damage. We have this guy who's got a fire enchanted sword. And then we've got this guy who has the anti-magic sword. And I think there's another variety too. What are, what are these guys? Cold, shock enchanted, shock enchanted, shock enchanted, cold enchanted. So there's a few varieties. I'm not sure exactly what all of them are, but importantly, it's a magic weapon um, that has a bonus effect uh, on damage. So anyway, pretty cool. Um, what this means is it's going to be kind of hard for people to thug against these guys because they're going to have all these extra on damage effects, which are going to kind of go through and chip at them and cause potentially other status effects. Like if you get hit with the shock one, you can get stunned. If you get hit with the cold one, you'll get the cold debuff. Um, and then, yeah, anyway. Uh, next up, we have the Scribe Fencer. And these are a strange, strange unit. So again, okay, these guys are 27 gold. These guys are also 27 gold, but these guys are 30 resources, whereas these guys are two. But you can only get three scribe fencers a month. Sorry, I had to click off for a second. Um, yeah, so you can get, only get three of these guys a turn. Uh, max recruitment three per month. You can get them in any fort. Same with these guys. These are both recruit anywhere. Um, and they have sloth power. And they have pretty good attack and defense stats. So in sloth three, they're going to be 17-17, which is pretty damn high. Um, they only have cloth armor, but they do have invulnerability 10. So against things that do not have magic weapons, they're going to have, like, 13 protection versus mundane. Okay. You know, it's not great, but they have good defense. Um, now, you may be saying, well, Lucid, there's not much to like here. Well, they also have fencing quills. And these are doing 8 armor negating damage, but the strength of the wielder is not added. So, yeah. Um, and they also can parry, or they can also repel a little bit because they're linked to. Uh, so, yeah, pretty cool. Um, they also have throwing quills, and they have their range 10, uh, a little precision bonus, and then six ammunition. So what is this? In, in, in effect, it's going to be pretty damn high precision. When Like, the fact that their range is only 10, but their precision is 14 means they're going to hit almost every one. Um... And so basically, it's going to be four armor negating damage plus DRN, which is pretty nice. So what you'll have, potentially, is like a front line of these guys, which are pretty good, but expensive. They're not going to you know, have a ton of them. They're not going to outnumber your enemy. And then you'll have some quill dudes behind them, and they're going to pummel people with throwing quills. And then when they're out of ammo, they're going to run in and smash them with their fencing quills. Or delicately poke them. Precisely poke them. Um, yeah. So anyway, they're a pretty good unit. They're deceptively good. You, you might look at this and be like, 27 gold for this? No, they're pretty good. And then magic weapons is pretty nice. So, yeah. Um, next up, we have these uh, statues. Now, the statues are special because you get statues in any province that has a wondrous workshop. Wondrous Workshop is a, is a site you start off with here in Capital. You can get more of them with a spell. Cost um, 10 Earth Gems, and you need an Earth 3 to, to get it. 
I forget if it has a range. Let's check. Now you, know, you can only cast it in the province you're in. So, um, yeah, anyway, once you have that, like, presumably you've built a fort, you have an Earth-3 mage there, you do a wondrous workshop, you can now get these. Now, there's a, a catch to want to the last one, but um, these first two, uh, a porcelain hoplite, so it's only 10 protection, but it's got slash and pierce resistance. It's got fire resistance and poison resistance, which is special because you're kind of weak to fire. So if you're fighting, you know, if you're like next to Abyssia, you might want to consider these guys. Um, they're amphibious, so they can go underwater. Never heals, which is a bit of a problem. And then formation fighter two, so you can pack a lot of these a square. I think like five. Um, but maybe only four, I'm not sure, I can't remember. So anyway, pretty, pretty solid. Um, in turn, you know, like they're okay. The problem, okay, they're also zero gold and 50 resources. So problem is they take resources and like, especially if you go sloth build, you're gonna have like our starting resources is 70. So you're not gonna like expand with these guys. If you go productivity, your starting resources may be like 140 or something. But that's not, that's not even three. So like, you're not gonna really use these guys in my experience for expansion. But you should never have spare resources left over in a fort for which you have a wondrous workshop because you always want to at least put them into something. Um, so yeah, that is the porcelain hoplite. Seems okay. Next up we have the library guardian. Now these are much more expensive. They're 150 resources. I mean, holy crap, that is a lot. Um, yeah, 150 resources, and they uh, are 22 protection and 13 hit points. Um, so if you go productivity, you can potentially get a few of these a turn once you've cleared your cap circle. But even at the beginning, you still can't use these for expansion. I mean, they're very tough. But 22 protection is not enough where you can sit there and tank indefinitely. You're going to take damage, and 13 hit points isn't a lot. These guys will die if you use them to expand in too low a numbers. So, in my opinion, there's no way to expand with these. These are no upkeep things you can do with your forts if you don't want to be producing troops. Now, part of the problem, though, is they while they're low, while they're essentially free in terms of gold, um, and they don't cost gems... It, what it's going to do is it's going to mean you don't have any resources to produce these dudes. And generally, you're going to need a front line. So at some point, I think you could switch to, like, Quill Masters and these. But producing only these, like only statues, especially in the early game and the mid game, it's very greedy. Because you need your forts to produce other things. Um, like units you can actually use in war... And while these are very efficient in terms of gold because they're free, you produce them so freaking slowly that it's kind of meh. Now, while these units are maybe not a great use of 150 resources, these, the Guardians of the Conclave, are much better because they're Protection 22. They hit a lot harder. They have a magic wep uh, weapon spear. Um, and they have more HP. So, better unit. Um, and they have a big honking shield. Uh, they both have big honking shields. So these guys are pretty, obviously pretty good. Um, and they don't have the never heal trait, whereas these do, which I didn't actually realize, which is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, anyway, these are our guardians of the conclave. Pretty nice. And... Uh, I think, uh, one last thing on these guys. I think they can heal in a lab. They can only be repaired in laboratories, yeah. Um, I think these guys can be, they do not need laboratories to heal. Um, one other catch of all these is not only do you need a wondrous workshop, but you also need at least one engineer in that province, which isn't really a big deal. They're cheap. You just have to spend a turn getting it. And then once you have an engineer and a wondrous laboratory, you can make these. 
Now, these guys are special because you cannot make these right off the bat. Um, you can only start constructing them once Sophia's divine influence will start pervading the world. And uh, what that means is you have to cast a Construction 9 spell uh, that's going to summon a very cool chassis for you. Um, will you be able to start recruiting these in every fort? And then when you recruit them, they're very slow to get at 125 resources. So these are the Guardians of the Conclave. They're sacred, so you could potentially take a bless around it. Um, and you have other things you can do, like you don't, we don't have a lot of sacred units just looking at it, but you have items that can make you guys sacred. So potentially if you had a bless that was good for these guys and good for thugs, you could take it. And then finally, we have the, the, the Juggernaut, the Huggernaut, the Juggernaut. I am the Juggernaut. Um, so this guy is a bit strange. It's 100 gold, but it costs no upkeep. Uh, just kind of how it's built in. And it's 1,000 resources. 1,000. <laughs> Which means, like, for me, it would take me literally a whole year to make one. Uh, once you get your cap circle cleared, you might be able to get them. You know, with productivity, you could probably get them every other turn. If you don't go productivity, it's probably, like, every three or four turns. Um... Now, what is special about them? Well, they can trample. They're size 6. They have 200 hit points. They're sacred. If you divine name them, they become a holy 3. And then they can smite and stuff. Um, they spread dominion, which is a powerful mechanic. Basically means it's going to be like a temple. So if you can spam these, you actually can have very good dominion pressure. I have no idea what just happened. My Steam thing just clicked me out. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, you can potentially stack up Juggernauts to have pretty high Dom push. Um, but there's a lot of, like, ifs to get there. You have to, like, dedicate your cap recruitment to it. You can't get anything else when you're getting it. Because, like, while this guy's queued up, if you have fencers behind it, they're not going to go. And you can't, like, keep scooting the fencers in front of it. At least I'm not aware of how. So you're basically going to have like only this in construction in your capital. Um, so anyway, that's kind of hilarious, but that's how it is. Um, and so yeah, we've been through all the units. Now I'm going to, we're, the video is already running a bit long, so I don't know if we're going to be able to go through all the items and all the spells. There's a few things I want to cover though. Um, first I want to show you a few of the items. Uh, we have four scrolls we can get. We have this one, which is going to give you flying storm immunity and mist form at the start of combat, 10 pearls. Um, and this is designed to be something you can put on and then you can kind of thug with it with the, an archivist. Um, then we have these guys, uh, the slashing scroll. It's going to have two attacks, and they're two armor negating attacks, so it's pretty good. And it's going to cast quickness on you at the start of combat. So it's really four armor negating attacks, which is pretty sick. Um, and then this is also going to increase your penetration. Uh, so also good to put on dudes. Uh, potentially, well, not everybody can wear it. You could have your, this guy can wield it, and he's going to have higher pen. So potentially, you you know, this guy could have like a rune smasher and this, which would give his penetration. I would give him, what, uh, three penetration. Then he can have Eye of the Void and the other little amulet that's going to give him... Um, three more so he'll be up at six if you have it in your bless and you give him a shroud and he'll be up at seven seven penetration is very 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 high very very high um but anyway this and it's cheap um so anyway if you're using archivists as like little mini thugs you can use this you also have this, uh, the Scroll of Exorcism, which has a ranged um, attack with limited ammo that's going to nuke undead. It's also going to give you MR and bless you. And then you have the Scroll of Sapience. This is significant for giving you reinvigoration and plus one astral magic. Um, potentially, maybe best on slaves, but you could also imagine putting it on... Um, let's see who can wield it, because not everybody can wield it. Um, they can be used by philosophers, Gnostics, and
and Keepers of High Mysteries. But Keepers of High Mysteries, you know, might not benefit from it because they don't really have any built-in paths. Um, so anyway, if you put it, if you go with philosophers and you put these on your philosophers, I don't even know who, who are agnostics. Do we have Gnostics? I don't remember saying Gnostic in the past hour. Yeah, I don't know who it means for Gnostics. Anyway. Yeah, you could put this on your philosophers, and now they're going to have um, plus one astral and good reinvigoration. This is potentially good for both a slave and a master. Getting the slaves above the path of a mas of their masters can give them significant fatigue reductions if you're spamming out a ton of spells. And then the reinvigoration on top of that uh, could be very, very significant. Uh, but you also may just say, well, you know, I want to have high astral and put this on your masters. So anyway, it's cheap. Five, five pearls. Uh, you have this power of the spheres, which is going to give you, it's not listed here, it's going to give you magic power 2, which is going to improve your stat line, useful for thugging. Uh, I forget who can wield this. I think everybody can. Yeah. Uh, but it's also going to give you, and it's mentioned in the description, but not, you can't see it in the stats. It's going to give you um, innate caster, which is nuts. It's one of the most powerful buffs in the game. This is really expensive like 25 pearls, but it's 25 pearls for something that's like phenomenally good. So um, it's one of those things like in the early and mid game, probably not worth getting, but by like late mid game or like, I mean, for us, like once you start getting the, the eights and the nines, this is in research is going to be really good. Um, <clears throat> we also have scrolls that protect. This one gives you protective force 20. And it also gives you a little defense and head protection and body protection. Um, and then we have a few oddities over here. We have another basically scroll of protection. It's the same thing we just looked at, which in the shield category can also be used in the miscellaneous category. Um, and then we have the master's librarian girdle. And this is notable. Uh, golems can wear it and it's going to give them plus one astral magic, which is nice. It's going to allow them to teleport, um, and it's also going to cast stone skin on them, which is something golems definitely enjoy. Uh, they don't have super great protection. Uh, and it's also going to bless them, which golems also kind of enjoy. Um, yeah. Uh, what else? Uh, it gives a bit of research. You, your librarians can also wear it too, so you can potentially put it on these guys, and they're going to have, or I'm sorry, your high bookkeepers. And, uh, yeah, you put on these guys, they're going to have pretty phenomenal stats. And it's cheap. It's, like, super cheap. It's five pearls. I mean, five earth gems. Very, very cheap. Um, we also have a creator ring, which is going to give you a forge bonus of two. So it's like a hammer. And it's going to give you Master Smith 1, which is going to increase your ability to forge maybe some hard-to-forge things you would otherwise might not have been able to reach. Um... And importantly, when you have this and a Dwarven Hammer, you're going to get a Forge bonus of four, I believe. So um, when you're forging, one of the things you're going to be forging almost every turn is one of these mantles for your Lore Masters. And anyway, every turn, you'll basically turn it into some kind of income because you'll just put it on whoever's going to forge it for this turn. And instead of spending uh, seven gems, you'll only spend... Uh, three, but because we are in a place with um, a construction bonus, like here you can see we're at, um, well, let's get this guy to do it. Here you can see we're at 145. And then if we forge, um, let's forge the Astral Cloak. This costs seven, and it's only going to cost six. I thought it would have actually given us one more reduction. But yeah, it only costs six. Um, if we make this, oh, interesting. Yeah, there's something kind of odd about that. This pendant should cost five. This should cost, do they make this cost more? 
It's kind of weird. You're only getting a one discount on something that costs seven, but you get a two discount on something that costs five. And this from the Wondrous Workshop. Hmm. A bit odd. Anyway, uh, I might figure that out later. But uh, we were talking about items. So we've got, yeah, we've got this. Oh, we were talking about the, the Ring of Creation. So uh, the Ring of Creation, yeah, going to help us forge some things we can. And then also it's going to be pretty useful in some of our very regular forging. This is a nation that's going to want to forge probably a fair amount of stuff. Um, and then finally we get Scroll of Fire Immunity, which if you don't, I think there's other ways to get fire resistance. It gives you fire shield. I don't think I would ever pay this. But I mean, you get really high fire resistance, but there's other ways to get really high fire resistance too. And I'd probably just do that. But if for some reason you can't find any fire gems, which is the normal way to get fire resistance, then yeah, you can do this. Um, there's a few other items which are kind of interesting. We have this one, the mystic, uh, metaphysical volume in. And this one, if I recall is going to increase the research efficiency of everybody in the province, and it's also going to give you fortune telling. Uh, I would say expensive for 60. But potentially worth it, because you're also going to stack up a ton of researchers in one place. So, I mean, this could potentially give you, like by turn 20, when you could potentially have construction 6, you very easily could have 40 mages in your capital and this would give you like 80 research for 60. I don't even think, I don't think it's worth it still. Well, this is gonna get a discount from your cap only site. So, or from the Wondrous Workshop. So it's only gonna be 48. And maybe that's worth it. The thing is with Recruit Anywhere philosophers, you're gonna be pulling people in from adjacent provinces to one cap. So inspiring researchers is gonna be way better on this nation than it is on others. Um, and then we have this one, the Codex of Four Elements. Uh, again, probably too expensive. I know Aether Nomad said he probably would buff this, like decrease the cost some, but it's going to give you one of all the four elementals, earth, fire, air, water. Um, but for 50 gems, it's just too expensive. And then we have this one, which is going to give you extra life, and it also allows you to spam the Petrify spell. Um, and then this one will end up being like after the Forge reductions and all that from Wondrous Workshop. It's only like 20 gems. Um, it could be worth it if you need to really spam Petrify. Um, and it's going to do it at low fatigue. And then we have this one. I think, what, yeah, it's an artifact that only this nation can forge. And it gives you... Basically, Astro Magic plus four, which is freaking nuts. It's super expensive. It's 140, uh, 140 pearls, but um, it's going to give you plus one magic. I think it's plus one all magic paths, plus four Astral Magic, and then start a battle time stop. I mean, this is one of the most nuts things I've ever seen. It's really nuts. I mean, potentially, we have a few other spells we're going to talk about, but potentially you can put it on the best unit maybe in the game, which is this one, Sophia, the unutterable vessel. Uh, I think she can wield it because it's a miscellaneous item. There's no reason why she couldn't, I don't think. And yeah, she could potentially fire off. A, there's a weird interaction, but you'd have to test it between... I mean, do I have the... I mean, we can test it. Too low a level, the fuck? I'd be level 10. Let's just see what this craziness is about. So it's going to be cheaper because we get the discount from our site, but I mean, it's still going to be super expensive. Holy shit, Astro 10. I just, we, we have to try this, guys. It's for science. 
this is some of the craziness that we're going to be able to do. You're, you're not even, you're honestly not even going to believe this. The amount of magic penetration we're going to have. Obviously, this is wildly expensive. And this unit could die, so I don't think you would ever do this exactly like this in a game, but... I just want to see how the interaction is too with master and slave and <laughs> we got literally everybody. <laughs> we got everybody. <laughs> There's nobody we didn't get. Alright, that's actually kind of funny. So anyway, you can, you see there's some crazy shit you can do. Um, you don't want to have that guy land in your army. Um, okay, so let's talk about some more spells. We've got... Um, there's a few kind of things we'll cover. We're not going to cover everything. Um, each school has one of these. Principles of something. And like this one, Alteration has Principles of Air. Conjuration has Principles of Fire. If you cast it, you get 15 pearls. It will add, when you first start the game, this site's not going to give you any gems. But every time you cast it, you'll get one gem of that type. Once you cast all of them, there's five. Um, and it's going to be uh, fire, air, water, death, and nature. Once you cast those five, then you're going to get, as an addition, um, earth and astral for free, essentially. But you've spent a lot. I mean, it's a 15-turn it's a payback. So it's kind of slow payback. But it's a way to kind of help also break you into other um, other magic paths in terms of gym income. And um, let's talk about some other things. So we have that in all the paths. All the paths also have unutterable alteration. Or not all the paths. Most of the, the magic skills have it. And this is cheap. This is only like 10 pearls. What it's going to do is it's going to upgrade your Sophia. But first... Oh wait, here's our Sophia. But first, to even get Sophia, you were going to need to cast Unutterable Vessel and spend 100 Earth Gems. And that's expensive and you have to have Construction 9, which is something you almost never want to get, so you're like kind of going out of your way for this. But when you cast this, you are now going to be able to forge, or to create in all of your forts, the Guardians of the Conclave. Now, one other thing I should have mentioned about Guardian of the Conclave is you can have a Holy Three enter the site in our archives and it'll get you one Guardian per turn. Which is kind of nice. Um, yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about the Unutterable Vessel. When you first get it, it's going to have basically the stat line. I think the attack and defense skills and stuff are going to be a little bit lower. Uh, it's going to be 100 HP. It's going to have no magic paths. Um, and only once you start... Well, let's take it back real quick. I'm going to take all the items off. I'll show you the base stats real quick. It's not going to come with this sword um, when you first get it. So uh, it's going to have no magic paths. It's going to have, I think, a little bit of all. And I don't think it's going to have any dominion spreading. That's when you first make it. It's kind of just like a naked chassis. And if that were all you got for 100 Earth Gems, it would be way overpriced. But once you start adding in these other things, uh, it becomes much better. Um, it's going to get um, air, earth... Uh, astral and holy basically it's going to get one of each of these every time you cast one of those spells it's also it's always going to get better um, and it's uh, in, it's going to start I think on the second cast maybe though maybe it's the first it's going to start getting innate caster which is a very powerful buff um, and it's going to get dominion spreader uh, and this is, these are both also going to increase um, and I think the reinvigoration may go up each turn too. I'm not completely sure. Um, or each um, time you you cast that thing on it. But anyway, uh, there's a few important things about this. It's got invulnerability 30. It's got all. It's got the resistances. I don't think it has blunt resistance. 
Um, it has a siege bonus. It has mindless, which is a pretty good tag. It has magic being, which is a not very good tag, and it has inanimate, which is a not. These are both bad tags, but this is a very good tag. Uh, it has blind, which is a good tag, and it has uh, spirit sight, which is a good tag. So it's got a fair amount of good things, but it also has a few bad things. It also has polymorph immunity, which is nice. Um, it's pretty good built-in MR. And it has Affliction Resistance 99. So it's immune to afflictions, basically. And it's a poor amphibian, so it can go underwater. Um, and it has Phenomenal Map Move. And then otherwise, just good stats. So anyway, that's this unit. Um, let's talk about more things. So uh, Master Architect, this is... we haven't, I haven't actually gotten one this game. Let's summon it. Uh, I forget what these guys are important for. I think if you want to have high earth magic, you get them, but I could be wrong. Oh gosh. This is a master architect. So they're masons. Oh, and they also, okay, this is the, the reason you may want to consider getting them, is they create resources. And they're going to give you 75 resources a turn. So in theory, you could stack these guys up. And they also cost no upkeep. You could stack these guys up in your capital um, where you're producing these. And you could essentially get where you, you know, if you got enough of them, you would need a shit ton of earth gems. But you could make it where you would produce one juggernaut a turn, which would be pretty nuts if you think about it. So anyway, it's something you could do if you wanted to. You could also just get more, you know, produce more of the other units. But I like the idea of producing one juggernaut a turn. That is something that's very appealing. But master engineers are super expensive. I mean, master, yeah. Um, so yeah, anyway, I'm not sure. I think it would depend on how disposable your earth income is for you. Uh, let's take a look at more spells. You can get Saruma, uh, Saruman's Mystics. Um, these guys are Astral 3, Death 3, which is pretty nice. Um, and then, yeah, okay. I think that was it. Alteration, I don't think we have anything. Special. That's you know, See, all the schools are going to have these two. Construction, we have a lot. So we can get... Uh, this is going to give you Library Guardians... These are, um, these do, oh wait, no, what are my Bray Guardians again? I think, maybe these are porcelain statues, I can't remember. Oh, it's these guys. Yeah, so, okay, you can spam out these. Um, so yeah, six of them for 14 pearls. In my opinion, not really very worth it. You can get Telesthetic Figure. That's going to give you one of these. You start with this when you start the game. Um, they're notable for being innate. They've got uh, innate caster one, which is pretty good. Um, and then otherwise pretty hard to kill and astral. So potentially they can like defend a province okay. They can do body ethereal and then cast stuff. And they're holy too, so they can do holy avenger. They're they're okay. Um, yeah, and then in a caster you can potentially use seven gems is pretty cheap, but you'll probably have better uses for your gems. And uh, yeah, that's this. We get stone monstra. These guys are kind of interesting. I don't think I have one right here. We'll get one. Um, they're interesting because they have homesickness. And uh, it's homesickness 20, so you can kind of send these guys out on little raiding missions, but they have never heal, so you need to bring them back home to get them to a lab where they'll heal. So they're kind of, they do hit and runs. They're not going to, like, stay away for long. And, uh, yeah, they have a siege bonus too, which I don't know if that's terribly important. But you can get these guys early, and they can help with expansion because they're only construction one. So you can have these guys really fast. Two of them expand a lot better than one. One tends to die against a lot of things because it doesn't kill things quickly enough, and then eventually it's going to get hit. 
Um, I find two expands better than one. And then if you put brands on them, because they have pretty bad attack skill, they'll do a lot better. Um, but there's, they're good thugs. Like they've got the mindless tag, which is great. They've got base high protection. You put good armor on them, they're going to be really tough. So definitely an asset. And I think they're one of the better kind of rush deterrents this nation has. Like if people don't have a way to kill these guys, then you're going to be in pretty good shape. Um, let's keep looking in construction because there's a lot of things in construction. Uh, porcelain hoplites, you can get, you can spend fire or earth gems on. You get a fair number of them. They're kind of garbage. I wouldn't spend the gems on them. Um, you have Gnostic Alchemy. This is going to give you Living Mercury. So if you have really high fire on your god and you get to construction three, you can turn seven fire gems into four Living Mercuries. Very early, that can be very hard for nations to deal with. There are not many things that are going to do well against a lot of Living Mercuries. Living Mercuries are very, very nasty. They're, they're basically going to punch things to death and they have a huge poison aura. Um, you can make clay men, which are kind of, I guess, okay as like bodyguards. Uh, but really what you're probably going to want to spend your water gems on is uh, manifest vitriol, which is going to give you green lions, which are really good. Earth gems, we can make a, a workshop. Um, but yeah, we can make living mercuries out of fire this way. This is going to turn five fire gems into one living mercury, which is potentially worth it still. Living mercuries are really good. Uh, we can also turn fire gems into green lions. I'm not sure. I think it would probably depend which case, which one's better. Like things with magic weapons, the living mercury is definitely better. Um, if you're worried about killing your own troops, the uh, the green lions are definitely going to be better. But I could see doing either. Um, you can do internal alchemy, which is going to reduce the age of your characters, which is nice. And you can summon watchers pretty pretty early here, like. Um, they're going to be good for patrolling. If you want to set up blood hunting operations, you probably just want one of these guys patrolling. You'll need to give them a commander that will help them patrol, but one guy will probably be able to keep a blood hunting operation going, or you know, maybe two. Um, like two would have a be able to watch over a very big blood hunting operation, and they're going to be very unlike a lot of the other blood hunting uh, patrol chaff. Watchers are going to be pretty good if thugs come in to raid. Um. You can get gargoyles. I, I don't know. It's okay. Guardians of the Conclave. This is going to give you three of the Guardians of the Conclave. These are the sacred statues for 14. It's okay. It's not great. Um, and then for Astral and Earth, you can get a Watcher for five pearls, which depending on... You have a lot of flexibility with what type of gym you can use to get these different... Uh, different, different units. Either the, the Manifest Vitriol, the Living Mercury... There's a lot of different ways to get them. I guess the living mercury, you need fire, but. Uh, lion sentinels, this is going to give you lions guarding a fort. It's also gonna increase order by one. Uh, Eternal guardian, this is, a, we should get one of these because uh, it is kind of one of your super combatants. This is an eternal guardian. They have random paths. I think they all have at least one air, two earth, and two astral, and then they get a random path with some even smaller chance randoms. Um, they don't have weapon slots, so you cannot get rid of these magic attacks. Um, but they're pretty good, because it's going to... Basically, it's a magic weapon attack, and then on top of that, it does armor negating pure magic damage. Uh, and that's for both of them. So these are kind of okay attacks. They're not great, but they're not bad. I mean, they're pretty good. They're, they're like very good anti-thug but they're not like a ton of like wave clear exactly they have very high uh protection because they have earth magic plus high base natural protection they can also cast earth uh, iron skin on themselves which will give them plus three i believe to this so they'll get them all the way up to 30. uh put some armor on them they're going to be extreme they can easily get to 40 protection which is very high uh, unfortunately, though, they are inanimate. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the problem with being inanimate is... Um, they're not going to... It's You would normally want to 
um, combine some kind of like regen or something with all this protection so that they would never die. So you end up having to come up with something creative for these guys. Um, you don't have lifesteal weapons. You can put on either because they have these hand slots filled. So there's actually not many ways to, to heal these guys mid-combat. Um, not many ways at all. In fact, I mean, you'd have to either do like a copper arm and then a lifesteal weapon, like a blood thorn, because most of the lifesteal weapons are two-handed. Or you would have to do like the bone cage or, or soul. I, God, let's figure out what it is. Um, this one, the bone armor. So 25 death gems is a lot, but it could be worth it. And they have really high protection, so they don't necessarily need any more, which is normally one of the reasons you don't go this. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's an option. You could do that, and then they're going to get basically soul vortex on them. Uh, and that is one of the ways they can heal. So anyway, um, pretty good. Is it expensive? Oh, a little bit. It's not that expensive. Uh, 50 pearls, I think, is probably worth it. Uh, you know, if we compare that to a golem, which I want to do, so I'm going to go in real quick. Holy shit. Oh, wait. No, it's because I have debug mod on. I was like, that can't be. You can't start off with it level zero. Wait, one second. I, I want to check. Well, we'll compare it real quick, and then we'll check. Where's my golem? All right, so here are the two of these. Now, why are they comparable? They're comparable because the costs, they both cost pearls, and they're pretty similar, like they're mindless. Uh, anyway, Golem's 30, this guy's 50. So let's say, if, is this guy worth? I don't think, I, I wanna check actually something else real quick. Let's make two of these. All right, he cannot wear them, but the Golem should be able to. I should get him off to three. Yeah, so he's astral through with this. So let's compare this. So the nice thing is the golem can wear this, which is going to give him stone skin, and it's going to up his astral to three, and it's going to bless him if you have a nice bless. So that helps level the playing field because otherwise this guy is sacred. Um, but I think they're both mindless, which are really good tags. Fire and poison resistance. So the golem has built-in fire resistance, which is kind of nice. And he has arm slots. So in some ways, he's more versatile. I think that's the main reason you would want to go a golem, is it's more versatile. Otherwise, I do feel like this is the better chassis. I mean, just this super high built-in base protection is phenomenal. It's going to be very hard for things to kill it that are not specially equipped to. Yeah. And these are very these are good weapons. So I think it depends. It depend I would say as a general purpose tool, this guy's better. Like if I had no idea it was gonna attack me and I just had one turn and just send something in, I would take this guy. If there was something this guy couldn't kill, then I would take the golem. Like if I needed a highly specialized counter, I would take the golem, I think. So anyway. Uh, that's the super combatant, and I think we're nearing the end of this. Uh, we can do Citadel Power for 80 Pearls, which is kind of cool, but also kind of expensive. Uh, Thaumaturgy is nothing much to say, except this is one of the nations that probably has the most powerful master and slave in the game. I mean, they can just rock it super hard. The only thing they don't have is stuff with built-in communion slave, which would be completely broken. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. We've talked about most all of the stuff. Um, I think I'll give a couple closing thoughts. Um, you get recruit anywhere philosophers that research like crazy and magic sloth. Um, you have pretty okay troops that are pretty good, but you're not going to have a ton of them. You're going to be a low army quantity, but reasonably high army qu quantity army. 
uh, you're going to scale extremely quickly into the mid game. Like your mid game is going to come very early, uh, but you're not going to have very big armies. Um, and you're going to reach the late game extraordinarily quickly also. Um, because of that, you're going to have first access, first shot at a lot of the globals. That's one of the things. Um, you're also going to have way better magic way earlier than anybody else would ever expect. So like turn 20 fog warriors. Nobody sees that coming. If you wanted to. Um, you can play sloth or productivity. I think you're going to have a much harder time with productivity in the early mid game. But if you choose it, you're going to be able to make so many juggernauts and so many guardians of the conclave in the late game if you can finagle it. Um, especially if you have a good bless that you think would go well with that. Um, and there's something appealing about a bunch of astromages sitting behind a bunch of statues. Um, but that said, I don't think you need it. Like when you have, with the kind of magic you have, I feel like this can be a really aggressive nation and playing where you're really weak early and you have to sit around and hope that later you can get all, you'll have enough resources and, you know, all this, that, and the other to, to get a ton of the, these guys, you know, and it's a little wishful thinking. Um, but I haven't played it before, so... I'm sure I will have a lot more to say about the nation after uh, I'm done playing it. And I will see you all in the next episode, which should be Pretender Design. So, uh, yeah. Take care.